And welcome back, everybody. Aaron Keller here on the Law and Crime Network. And we are listening in to the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, as the judge and the attorneys on each side start to discuss the jury charge or jury instructions in this case. This is going to be more critical in this case than perhaps in some of the other cases that we've observed here, because how to characterize what happened is where the jury is really going to stick in this case. To help us break the process down, I'm going to turn to law and crime trial analyst Julie Rendelman, who is here today. Julie, good to see you today. Thanks for having me. So, okay, jury charges in a case where the facts really aren't in dispute. We know who had the gun. We know why he had the gun. We have heard insinuations as to why he may also have had the gun. But look, the mechanics of this are pretty well known factually. It's just a question of how to characterize him. Is it aggravated assault? Is it something more like criminal negligence? Is it murder with intent or depraved heart or something? It's a characterization exercise, and that's why the jury instructions are going to be really, really important here. Well, it's also important not just the specific charges, whether it be murder, manslaughter, or any of those things, but it's also the additional charges that the jury's considering. For example, there's often a charge on motive. Um, a, you know, a judge will instruct them and give an explanation of whether motive's necessary. The judge will instruct them on inconsistent statements, how to value, you know, what witnesses testify to, how to evaluate credibility. And so before both the defense and the prosecution can sum up, they need to know what the guidelines are for the jury instructions so that they can follow them when they are presenting their specific closing arguments to the jury. So it's incredibly important in every case, particularly this one, so that both sides know exactly what the boundaries are for what they're going to be closing on. Now, model jury instructions, that is pre-printed jury instructions, can be a huge benefit because a lot of attorneys will use them when leading up to trial rather than trying to pick apart the statute themselves. How is this going to be explained to the jury? And they incorporate that language all the way through the trial. Right. I mean, look, a good attorney is going to know what the charges are going to be at the end of the day, well, and they're yeah. going to know the instructions. And the reason is, is because as a prosecutor, when you open, you want to make sure while you're not quoting the law, um, you are following the law so that your facts fit what the law is. Um, but, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's important. I think that... In this case, like many cases, there's going to be additional requests on both sides for specific issues, um, whether it be expert testimony, because we've heard from a lot of, I guess we're going to call them experts. I think some of them, I, I would say borderline, are not really experts. Um, but how the jury can consider these individuals. And I think that the language that's used um, is going to be viewed on both sides, including Mr. MacGyver himself, to make sure that the language is beneficial to their side versus the other side. Exactly. And we also have these lesser included in the mix now as well. We've been sitting right. here saying that this doesn't smell like a murder case. And there's a couple different flavors of how murder could play out in Georgia. One is just saying, look, he had the intent to cause her death. That's right. the top version of it. There's sort of a middle ground version of it in Georgia that says, well, he acted with a depraved heart. OK, so he he did something with depraved indifference as to whether she lived or died right which is which is which is the same um level of charge as intentional it's viewed the same way it, it results in the same punishment right but, it, but you can use different facts to try to get to it right then you've got felony murder which is when someone dies during the commission of an underlying felony and they're trying to get to that in a really in, in look you rightfully rolled your eyes because this case is just a very bizarre case for that right but they can get to the top charge if they convince the jurors that this was an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and that she died as a result of the aggravated assault right which then basically hops the charge all the way up to murder but don't it, you still kind of, but you still need the intent for the aggravated assault yes Right. And so, so chaos, love, problem. That is the problem exactly. that we have here. So it, it just it results in kind of getting to the same place right. through five or six different directions. I, but even with all of those different directions, I don't see any of the three fitting here. I think one of the things you express concern about, and I understand, is the language and the way that the jury is read. Um, the, so there's the intent murder, and then there's the depraved indifference murder, which is all encompassed in that specific murder charge. 
And the concern, of course, is how the judge is going to instruct the jury as to how that's defined. Because the minute you start to use any type of negligence uh, or the words negligence, that starts to concern the defense side because of the allegations that he was sitting or sleeping or had something to drink with a gun in his hands. I don't think under any theory that what happened rises to the level of what we call depraved heart or depraved indifference to human life. Um, but certainly, I think the prosecution has a right to argue that if they choose to. Yeah, so let's dial this back a little bit for people following. When you talk about that sort of second notch down on the murder right. statute, it's still murder, but it's you know, depraved heart murder, depraved indifference to human life. What does a case like that look like? Uh, I, I mean, the thing, you know, I can only think of a scenario if, you know, if, if, an, if, if there's a, a crowd that's gathered, um, you know, for a party, you know, below a large building and there's someone upstairs up on the top at the roof holding a cement block and he throws it down and someone is killed. He didn't intend to kill anyone, but he certainly acted with depraved indifference to human life. Yeah, throwing a, a, a cinder block off of the top of a building could result in someone's in, death. And we see this a lot with those scenarios where dro cars are driving by mm -hmm. and someone goes on the overpass and throws something heavy down, hits the vehicle. That that can be yeah, something that You don't that intend to that kill level. that specific person, which would be the top, that murder A, subsection A, but murder subsection right. B is doing it this way. So, and, so could the jury here say, okay, well, um, you know, his conduct, the, the falling asleep in the back of the car, the having the gun out, having the gun loaded, having the gun pointed in the general direction of his wife, the alcohol, the falling asleep with what apparently are known sleep problems, could this all add up to meet that you know, subsection B of the murder statute. Well, anything's possible. Now, in certain states, you have to choose. Uh, I don't think that this is one of them, but in certain states, you have to choose between intentional and depraved. You're not allowed to get a shot at both. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear as to, to what the rules are with regards to this specific state in Georgia. But do I think that the evidence supports depraved heart in this case? I don't. Um, because remember, you have to view it in such a way that the person acted with such depravity such wanton disregard for the life of others. You just don't care if somebody you lives or dies. You don't care if someone lives yeah. or dies. I just, you I just don't do it think anyway. Look, this is a state where guns are allowed, um, and you're allowed to possess I'm, a gun. I'm unaware of a state where guns aren't allowed, but anyway. Uh, you understand, you know, where he's allowed to carry a, a licensed gun in his vehicle. And so, um, so we're, it's already acceptable to have the gun there. I don't think that rises to the level of depraved indifference merely because he is has some alcohol in his system, which we clearly haven't even established how much alcohol he exactly had, or that he had a sleep disorder, rises to the level of the depraved wanton indifference that we'd be needing in this type of case to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So, so if he gets something here, um, you know, the aggravated assault basically requires the same intent finding, Correct. so we're stuck in the same thing. So, uh, you know, possession of a weapon during a felony, you, you got to find the felony in order to get to that. Right. But what, what about these lesser included here, where they're talking about criminal negligence? Well, those, now, that might. Those stick. are the things that I think that I was always interested in. I think these are what they started with before they were hell bent on going after him for these higher charges that I think we all agreed were probably too high. So I think they do have a shot at them. I think one of the concerns, and I don't know if I call it a concern, or one of the concerns possibly for the prosecutor is, have they focused? too much on the intentional acts that the jury is kind of going to give they can do some type of nullification and say, you know what, we're not giving them anything because you, because we really don't care anymore. Um, and so, yes, I do think that's the fear that that's the fear for the prosecutors that they've spent too much time and they've lost credibility with the jury. Exactly. Uh, now that, that's you got to the word that I was going to use as a prosecutor. I was always told when I was in a prosecutor's office when I was in other offices that involve prosecutorial work that you can't oversell things because members right. of the jury are going to think that you have no credibility on the back end. You're characterizing something as something that it turns out not to be. And, and we had this issue uh, in the Stephen Jones case that we covered last year here on Law and Crime. That's the, the shooter on the Northern Arizona University campus. And I think the prosecutor drastically oversold right. that case. He kept using this phrase, an assassin emerging from and the no, dark. And he and, never viewed any, and no one ever viewed him as such. And, and the defendant gets up there and it's like he's a homeschooled guy who right. was raised in a very weapon-friendly house, and, and if anything, the prosecutor should have turned around and said he unnecessarily went for the weapon, not 
knowing how to characterize the threat. He could have gotten a conviction if he characterized the case another way. Also, what cuts against um, kind of this, uh, the belief that the prosecution can make out their case is one could argue that the victim herself is the one who handed him the gun. So the victim herself didn't view there to be any specific danger of turning over that gun. And so that can also mitigate the jury's view that, view that he acted negligently. I do think what goes against him is the cover-up. And so I think the jury may view the cover-up, meaning the, the different things he did to try to protect himself, which in certain ways he had every right to do, and he knew, and a lawyer should or any person should know to, to protect themselves in terms of when they're accused of a crime. But the cover-up may be viewed by the jury to be a cover-up of the negligent or even criminal negligent act and not the murder. And so therefore, they might view that as um, as a basis for why he's guilty of the lesser. I would agree with that. So on that note, we will continue to talk about that when we come back. We're waiting for these instructions and these discussions to sort of hone in on that area that Julie and I are talking about right now, because that's where it's really going to stick in this case. While we wait for things to really pick up in court, which is indeed back in session, I want to continue to look at the testimony of Danny Jo Carter. She was the driver in the car. She was friends with both the victim and the defendant. Her testimony seemed very credi credible to me. Let's continue where we left off. Okay, folks, we're at that point in the jury instruction argument process where the attorneys are going back and forth about exactly how they're going to explain the lesser ex included offenses to members of the jury. Julie Rendleman is here with me. And look, there are model instructions that are printed up with a general sense of how the law works in these areas. This is where the various sides, the attorneys, get to say, well, you know, judge, I don't know if that word is the best word right here, so let's use this word instead. And, and this is a fine-tuning process that sure. we're watching. Yes, it is. And, and you were saying that there's some jurisdictions where the judge will basically say, this is what, uh, you know, we have to read and I'm not going to make any exceptions to it. In New York and, and in many states, um, they do allow both the prosecutor and the defense to, to make some changes as long as it's consistent with the case law. Um, and so this is basically what they're doing. I mean, um, just going through each charge to make sure um, that that they have their say in how it's going to be read to the jury. My favorite instance of being involved in a case that didn't have a model instruction on a particular charge because it was a very rare charge was I was asked to basically write one up and it was a real fun one because the way I wrote it was heavily in favor of our side. Right. And the judge bought it because he said, well, it's bulletproofed with all of these citations. The other side lost the case because of the instruction. Right. Now, the most hysterical part of it was that the other side was a law school professor of mine who then... He must have loved you after uh, that. It, it was a she, um, but uh, she confronted me about it, and I said, well, you should be happy. You taught me well. No, it's... <laughs> well, it, so... It, exactly. And by the way, it's not uncommon for... for for both sides, one side or the other, to want to add language, um, you know, to give j juries instructions when when the facts of the case are, you know, of a specific ilk that they, they feel it needs to be explained more clearly in, in that specific type of case. Exactly. Look, I mean, th the bottom line is that the jurors need to understand the law that they're being asked to apply. In this case, right. I kind of feel sorry for the jurors because I've been sitting here reading all of these statutes and the lesser included, and I'm trying to characterize this thing as well. Right. But now we're in these lesser included, the negligence, criminal negligence. Yeah. That one might stick here. So let's talk about that. Criminal negligence, how do we define it? Um, well, I mean, in terms of this case, you know, the issue becomes, and I, I think you have to separate the depraved indifference, uh, which is in the murder, st in, the, in the top count, from the simple criminal negligence and so because there's a difference between the two because you can act criminally negligently and be responsible um, you know criminally in Georgia without having that that thing we defined as the wanton disregard um, for the life of another individual and so the question becomes whether or not the acts of having a loaded gun um, in your hand in your seat um, when you are nodding off because you're um, either uh, have a sleep disorder or because you're drinking excessively um, and the result thereof is that the gun goes off accidentally, does that rise to the level of a potential negligence charge? And I think it's 
possible for it to fit into that, although I still have some doubts as to whether they can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, uh, this will this will be the point of critical mass here. It seems, I agree with you, more likely that we might get a reckless conduct uh, or more likely a criminal negligence count here, but the penalties for those are much, much less than you would a murder charge is life in prison. Right. You know, these charges are... You know, I think the one is a misdemeanor, so that's 12 months. Right. So if they get this knocked down to that, that would be a huge win. So let's continue listening to some of the critical testimony of Danny Joe Carter. She was the driver the night that this gun went off. Again, the defendant, Tex McIver, was in the back seat of an SUV. His wife was in the front passenger seat. A friend was driving. Tex McIver says he asked for his gun because he thought he was in a dangerous area. He saw people milling about was afraid for the safety of himself and the two women in the front seat. And he said that in the process of riding in that back seat, he was nodding on uh, in and out of sleep, that at one point he woke up, the gun went off, he says accidentally, and he says that's how this happened. Could that be criminal negligence? Well, some of the testimony of Danny Joe Carter might be critical in helping the jurors understand that. Let's go back and review some of her testimony. 